Thank you very much, Kevin. Thank you for the kind introduction. Thank you for the hospitality I've had so far and uh, also to the Dominicans at St. Joseph's Church. It's been very enjoyable so far. So, I just want to begin. I'm going to talk today on the, the formation of Catholic artists, which is what I was asked to, to speak about. Just to give you a sense, this is the, a sense of what I do. This is the chapel at Thomas More College, and this is some of the work that I've done. We're just about to add a, a, quite a large Christ in Majesty there into the gap on the wall beyond the hanging cross, which you have a detail there. The other thing I'm very interested in is promoting Gothic imagery and trying to revive that as a, a living tradition. Um, so this is a, uh, something that I painted based upon 13th century um, illuminations in the Westminster Psalter. And for those who are interested, I never miss a chance to publicise myself. Um, I'm offering a class at Thomas More College, which is open to anybody in March, so think about that. Now, I'm just going to begin my story at the Brompton Oratory in London. I don't know if anybody here has been to this church. It's very well known for its liturgy. My experience of this church began in the early 90s when a friend heard that I was shopping around churches. I, I actually began by shopping around religions, narrowed it down to Islam and Christianity. And <laughs> This is before everything happened recently. It, didn't, it, seemed, it didn't seem so obvious then. Um, so I went for Christianity, then started to, to look at different churches. And this friend of mine just said, why don't you go to this church next to the Victoria and Albert Museum um, in London and go at 11 o'clock. He didn't say anything more about it. And I, was, I had a conversation about something else with him. And as we finished the conversation, I remember him saying, he stopped and said, just to make the point, if you go again, if you go to this church tomorrow, make sure you go at 11 o'clock. And what he was directing me to was the solemn mass uh, at the, the London Oratory. And I can remember going, it wasn't obvious, it, it looks, that, that's an aerial view where you get a sense of the church, but if you're at street level, it looks like the other museums and the other buildings, and th th this was deliberate, they, it was built in the 19th century, they didn't want it to stand out at that stage, and so I, I couldn't work out where the entrance was, what, where the church was, and it was about five past eleven by the time I got in. This is what it looks like on the inside. So I knew I'd got the right place. This is obviously a church. And the thing that struck me, that when I went in, it was full. I smelt incense immediately. I just, I just was hit by the smell. I went in, and I could see shafts of sunlight coming down, as you see there, and this smoke rising up. And later, when I read the descriptions from the Bible, the, the incense rises like the smoke of the sorry, like the, the prayers of the saints, I remember that first impression. The choir was singing Palestrina, and I'd never actually heard it, I think I must have heard it on the radio or record, but not very often. To actually hear the choir singing it, it I don't think I'd heard anything so beautiful. And I remember the thoughts just crossed my mind as I heard this, this, this must be what angels sound like. I, I just, I wasn't, contemplating, just the thought just came to me. Um, and I started to look around just to see where the choir was, because I, it, I, you know, I couldn't see where they were. It, the, the noise just seemed to fill the atmosphere like the incense and the sunlight. It just seemed to be part of the, the fabric of the whole church, part of the space. And in fact, they're up front, sort of halfway down on the right, but I couldn't see that. So I, I thought maybe they were up behind me, and I looked up, and I saw angels flying across the ceiling in mosaic in this church. And I remember thinking, this whole, you know, this has been planned. Uh, they are assaulting my senses and redirecting them. And uh, the other thing that I remember after that initial impression was watching the people in the church and through their body language, their f I knew that there, there was faith there. They all knelt at the same time, they stood at the same time, they were looking forward. The priest was celebrating Ad Orientum, so everybody was in the, in the same direction. It made an impact on me. And I knew, without really being aware of what I was 
watching, what I was seeing. I didn't know anything about the Catholic Mass at this stage. It really was very early days of looking at churches, that when the host was held aloft, I knew that that was the most important time, or very important. Everything seemed to stand still for a moment, and it was just the attitude of the people and the way that everything was coordinated to make that the focal a focal point in the event. Now, the Brompton Oratory is a beautiful church, has beautiful liturgy, but as architectural features go, it isn't the greatest. Um, I don't think if the, if the liturgy wasn't there, I don't know that people would travel to London especially uh, to see this. It's counted as Victorian neo-Baroque. The art is not especially good, apart from the Luigi Scrossopi, of course. But I would say that in, order, in, in regard to its function, it, is, it was just perfect. It had that effect on me. Everything was there designed, coordinated in a fully integrated event to communicate to me, the person who really did not know what he was seeing at all, the importance of what was going on, and it worked. I, could, I didn't know what any of the words meant. It was in Latin, um, and I couldn't understand it. And I didn't even know that it was Latin. I mean, that's how ignorant I was. I just didn't know what I was listening to. I was trying to think. It. Funny, I couldn't place it at all geographically or in time. I was thinking, is this Eastern? It's not, I don't know. I, it, it, it seemed otherworldly, is all I can say. Okay, so the reason I mention that is that this is the impact that beauty can have, um, especially when it's in harmony with the liturgy. It's one of the most powerful um, things that weapons that we have, and I can use that word for touching people. And uh, when it's connected to the, and in, in integrated with the liturgy, then um, it's, it really can touch people's hearts. What happened was that I realized fairly quickly that not all churches, not even all Catholic churches, were like the Brompton Oratory. I started to go to others. Um, and a lot of them I was cringing with embarrassment. I felt that the, the music, for example, it, it, I felt that like I was a grown man asking, being asked to sing nursery rhymes that five-year-old boys wouldn't want to sing. Um, it just seemed childish. So very different experiences. Despite that, I, I, I converted. Um, <laughs> and, uh, I really, at that point began to think about why, what was it about the Brompton Oratory that was different. And this really hit home when I saw, it wasn't this, the crucifixion on the right, but it was something like this, where you'd say it's something obviously 20th century, deliberately non-traditional style of imagery <coughs> that had been commissioned for a church somewhere in London. I can't remember now. And I remember looking at it and thinking, well... I, I don't know why, but I just think that is ugly. Um, I have to say that I don't think it does anything for my worship, for my prayer, for my uh, participation in the liturgy. Um, and the, the crucifixion on the left by Velazquez, the Spanish Baroque artist from the 17th century, clearly stylistically it's very different. And I remember thinking, well, if, if somebody commissioned something like that, I think that would have done the job. Um, I began to wonder, is it just down to taste? Is there, are there any guidelines at all? Is there anything that tells us uh, that one is good, one is bad? Or is, are we just hoping that the priest or whoever commissions the art has good taste and the artist is able to realise it? And so I started to investigate. I was interested in being an artist, and it, this motivated me not only to think about it more, but to try and contribute by painting. So I did the, the obvious thing. I looked up uh, Catholic art school in the telephone directory under C um, <laughs> in London. Uh, couldn't find it. Uh, so then I started to look further afield. Britain, Europe, America. It just didn't exist. I, I mean, I, there was nowhere that could tell me where you could train to, to paint the sort of art that I was interested in or even tell me what the basis of it was. So I, at this point, had to start investigating on my own. So eventually I decided what I was going to have to do was <laughs> found this art school and then enlist as its first pupil. Um, 
And I started to talk to people. I, I would find some people who knew bits or who could paint in particular ways. I thought, well, I'll try and pull them together. Um, but I realised that it wasn't going to happen, that they needed one person to do it. And so I persuaded people to train me in this, to teach me about that, and just decided that and they may not be the, the perfect person to do it, but as far as I know, I'm the only person who, who was interested in doing this. And at one point, I, I honestly thought I was the only one. And I was just saying to Kevin earlier, there's, there's, it's great to have groups like this where there seems to be genuine interest making contact with each other. And there's a sense that now I think we're looking back at our traditions and uh, something might happen. So as I progressed, I started to realise that we do have traditions. That there aren't rigid guidelines, or there are very few actually, which is a frustration to some. I, mean, I think some wish that the church would actually stipulate precisely what <laughs> ought to go in a church. But in a way, that's the strength of the church, or it was in the past, that it allows for variety and um, each tradition it must reinvent itself for every generation otherwise it, it, it cannot rest on its laurels it must speak afresh to every new generation otherwise it will die um, it has to, to apply the principles it must understand what the principles are that define it but um, reapply them so that each generation can be touched and so I started to look at this, and I'm going to give you a little bit of information about these traditions, although it's not the, the main part of what I'm talking about um, today. I, the, I also started to look at the formation of artists. When I was studying in Florence, um, we were learning uh, this traditional style of art, academic art, it was called, for, named after the academies or the schools that were set up in the 16th century and the 17th century and the method they developed um, of painting. And in some ways it was, it was great to be there, that here were people who were interested in traditional styles, very few of them, uh, there were the odd Catholic, but most of them not driven by faith, but really just by a reaction against modern arts and wanting to do something traditional. But in other ways there was a pessimism about them. Everybody knew that not, these places had, had been re-established in the 70s, I would say, um, and so far nobody was producing work anything like the quality of the 17th century masters. Everybody agreed that Velazquez or maybe Van Dyck was, was the greatest artist, perhaps Rembrandt, and everyone was desperately looking to see what the secret was that was going to turn them into a Rembrandt or a Velazquez or a Van Dyck. Um, some would look for, do for documents that would outline the methods. Others would discover... And we had one lecture in which a person focused on the, the white pigment that Rembrandt used and said, we don't know what that is, we're trying to do the analysis. You know, he, I, and I got the sense that he believed, if only we knew what that pigment was, <laughs> we would be painting like Rembrandt. Now, it occurred to me that the, what we needed to do was not look at study Velazquez, but actually study how he was taught. And in fact, there was a book on the art of painting written by his teacher, called Francesco Pacheco. It's in Spanish and it's 700 pages long, so I've only seen short parts of it translated. So if anybody wants to do a, a translation job, I would love to see that done. But it's, it's quite a big job. But the, the thing that occurred to me was that I'd never heard of Francesco Pacheco. I don't know if anybody here has. He actually trained quite a, 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 a number of well-known artists, and one is Alonso Cano, and was associated with that realist movement in Spain in the 17th century as a teacher. And it suddenly occurred to me that if teaching is simply a process of a teacher passing on to a student what he knows then by definition, teaching is going to actually end up in the diminution of knowledge and ability because nobody can pass on <coughs> all that they know. Now, this was the assumption in these places. You, you, were, you were trying to glean information out of the teacher. Now, of course, that's a good thing. But why? how could uh, Velazquez be greater than Pacheco? What enabled him to do that? Um, you might say 
just sheer genius. He just had the ability, and that might be part of it. But I would say also that um, his training allowed him to respond to grace. In other words, there's something coming in laterally that allows him to flourish and be a greater artist than his teacher. And therefore, no education process um, really should even think about calling itself be worthy of the name if it doesn't at the same time open the students up to God's grace. And so I started to think about that. What was the spiritual life of these artists like? How, how would they have lived their lives? I started to look at Catholic education. I went to talk to people who were experts in the medieval universities um, at Oxford, for example, and uh, talked to them about how, what life would have been like in the Oxford colleges and the Cambridge colleges prior to the Reformation. And all of this was to an end. And... You could summarise it, I would say, with this, that if you want to be a good artist, you need good ideas, you need the skills to realise them. Simple as that. Um, where do you get those from? Well, you could teach the practical skills, and very important in this is understanding our traditions, as well as understanding the needs of the church today. It's very unlikely, it's possible, but it's unlikely that what is needed today is going to be precisely what was needed in the 17th century. And so we must respond and adapt and develop. So it doesn't mean that you produce something that is, unless it re the need demands it uh, in an extreme case, but you're not producing something that is wholly new in response to that need, but you're looking at traditions and allowing... Uh, the need of today just to direct you into reapplying the, these principles. So you modify and redirect. Um, and in order to do that, you need to have a deep understanding of where we're coming from, what the, the Catholic traditions in art are, so that you can apply those principles in a new way without contravening the essential elements that make it a tradition. As well, we need a prayer life that forms us in virtue and love in accordance with our personal vocation. Of course, if we're not meant to be an artist and we're looking for inspiration, it's never going to be there. It'll, it'll, God will inspire us to do other things. But, of course, that, that, if we, as long as we discover what that is, we will flourish. Um, so part of this, of course, is, is trying to discern what our personal vocation is. It's very important. So I'm just going to focus initially on this formation. Now, for a Christian education process, formation is transformation. Uh, what do I mean by this? This is a, uh, an icon done by Theophanes the Greek. I, I think he's 14th century. He's the teacher of Andrei Rublev in Russia. It's the transfiguration, which you'll recognize. Uh, the three apostles down below, the two prophets flanking Christ in the center, and it's seen as an anticipation of his heavenly glory, shining with the uncreated light of heaven and really giving us a sense of our destiny to be, as I think it's uh, Maximus the Confessor and, and various church fathers said, God became man so that man could become God. We, uh, through Christ, we worship God the Father in the spirit, in the liturgy, and in heaven, that is the activity of heaven. It's this per perpetual exchange of love. And we are united to Christ and we can enter into a personal relationship with Christ as man. And because Christ is both man and God, through Christ, God the Father. We enter into the mystery of the Trinity and are divinized. The phrase that they use is we partake of the divine nature. It, it is an extraordinary privilege. But it... it and never to be complete, fully perfected, if you like, until we hope we get to heaven. However, in this life, by degrees, we can participate in that transformation in that, um, as part of the mystical body of Christ, part of the church, and through participation in the liturgy, the earthly liturgy, which, is a supernat which supernaturally participates in that heavenly liturgy. And so we can by degrees, shine with the light of Christ. And so 
Christian formation is transformation, it is transfiguration, and it is open to us in this life, in a, along with the joy, the Christian joy that goes with it. This is the, the thing that we need to understand. Much of the hope that we have can be realised in the here and now. And the, the centre of the, this Christian life that gives us this is the liturgical life. It's the, it is our heavenly end, and it's, it's our earthly purpose, if you like. And... There's a book called The Wellspring of Worship. I don't know if anybody's read this by Jean Corbon. And he, he talks about the new evangelization. He says that this is not about training Christians to go out to preach and to know how to answer questions. We want to do all that, of course. But in the end, what attracts people to us is that people see the way we live our lives because something about the way we do the mundane things in life attracts their attention. They want what we have and they're curious. And we can answer questions. And all of that uh, attraction, excuse me, comes through this, the supernatural, through this participation in this transfiguration. And so this is how we are transformed. It's how artists are transformed. It is how anybody else is transformed. And... In the end, we could stop the lecture there, and you, would have, you have enough information. If you know what your personal vocation is, and you make the liturgy that you're the centre of your life, you will, realize, you will become what God wants you to be, and if you're meant to be an artist, you will be formed as, you, as you're meant to be. Quite what that path will look like, I couldn't tell you. However, as they say, pray for rain and dig for water. Um, <laughs> there are things we can do as well, and we should. In addition to that, I should say that that process, given that that is what is available to us, the, the fruits of a participation in the liturgy. I was at a conference in Rome over the summer on the sacred liturgy, and they listed the, the fruits of participation in sacred liturgy. And they said it, it evangelizes the uncatechized, it catechizes the evangelized, it, it inspires the uh, creativity. Um, it makes the uncreative, creative, basically anything you, you want, you, you're looking for, it gives you. And I, I'm a, from a liberal arts college, and you grow in virtue. This is uh, the source of wisdom. Okay? All the things that a Catholic liberal arts college claims to give to its students are actually there for everybody in the liturgy. And it says what a Christian education should be directed to. It should be... It, we, we, we can't impart these things directly or not most powerfully. We can actually give people, equip people with the information so that they can participate in the liturgy as deeply as possible. Of course, it requires their cooperation and their desire to worship God the Father through the Son in the Spirit. But then all of this will be realized. And I don't know, it, it's a less read, anyway, I was less aware of it, um, of the... Uh, is an encyclical, I'm not sure, Sacramentum Caritatis, um, signed by Pope Benedict, section 64, headed Mystagogical Catechesis. He says that mystagogy is the process of deepening the mysteries. In other words, it's teaching people to participate in the liturgy. And he says that the aim of all Christian education is, the tr is, is this, so anything, it's not Christian unless we can say how this relates to our participation in the liturgy and how it will deepen it. And if it doesn't, it's not worth teaching, I would say. Um, it's to train the believer in adult faith that can make him a new creation. He's talking about that transformation, participation in that transfiguration, capable of bearing witness in his surroundings to the Christian hope that inspires him. And then he says, the greatest teacher in these things, this is me paraphrasing, is in fact the liturgy itself. So we develop and give ourselves to liturgical worship. Right, I'm going to come back to that. I just want to focus a little bit on the practical skills, the, the, the digging for water bit of the, the uh, formula. The traditional training of an artist involves... Uh, the copying of old masters with understanding, the observation of nature, and the study of traditional ideas of harmony and proportion. 
Why do we copy old masters? It is through this that the, the ability to paint in a particular style is transmitted. If I want to paint superheroes um, in sort of strange uh, postures, bulging with muscles that look like Spider-Man or Superman, I go to life drawing classes and I couple, mo copy Marvel magazines time after time after time, and that will become the natural way that I draw. If I want to paint icons, I copy icons. If I want to paint Baroque style, I paint the Baroque style. I observe nature as well. Um, I have to, in a sense, that's where individual style comes from. I, I respond directly to God's creation. Um, and in doing this, it develops a humility by copying and being directed by a teacher who says, the arm is in the wrong place, the eye goes there, the ear is here, have a look at this, it's wrong. Okay? This, when you have a teacher doing that and forcing you time after time to do it, it develops a, um, a humility which is attached to, to the development of the skill. And so when you leave the school, you instinctively look for that direction. And of course, if the teacher isn't there saying, put the charcoal here, put the charcoal there, um, you will reach instinctively for God's inspiration. That is the idea. So... Now, it must be done with understanding. You don't copy blindly. Well, you can't, can't copy blindly. You should copy unthinkingly, <laughs> if I should say. Um, although, go to a modern art school, I'm going to copy blindly. Uh, you have to understand what you're doing. And when I was studying iconography, my teacher, Aidan Hart, would talk a lot. He would explain what it is we were doing. And sometimes you would correct the old masters. I mean, you look at a a very well-known icon say, well, actually, what the, uh, the master was trying to do here was this, and I don't know if we can do it better, but we, we can see that he didn't succeed, so we're going to try. And my teacher would point that out. So all the time, you're thinking about the ideal that was in the mind of the person painting it, what the ideal is that you're striving for. In addition, you learn traditional ideas of harmony and proportion. And these are actual numerical relationships, numbers, you know, mathematics. It's not just a, an intuitive sense of one thing being in relation to another. Of course, you're developing that, but you can actually look at documents such as De Arithmetica by Boethius, De Musica by Boethius, the works on architecture by Vitruvius, which they would draw on the, the, the Pythagorean tradition that you see in Vitruvius. And you could study that and see that there are actually um, ideas of harmony that can be incorporated into design and, um, again, will affect, once you absorb them, how you relate one thing to another in the design of things at an intuitive, at an instinctive level. Okay, so let's just talk about what these traditions are. Um, I... Could, I, I spend a year basically teaching what's on one slide here when I'm at Thomas More College. You can talk at length about each of these and relate the style of them to the theology that governs them. And, and each of these are, is a valid tradition. Now, I'm drawing on Pope, Benedict, the, uh, Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI's book, The Spirit of the Liturgy. And he says there are three um, figurative traditions which are authentically liturgical traditions. The iconographic. Now the icon is the art uh, that um, seeks to reveal man in heaven. Or in John Paul II's theology of the body he called it eschatological man. Um, and the style of it is deliberately uh, governed, is governed by the theology, if you like, or understanding of what man is like in heaven. Um, and it's important to be aware that it is not simply an Eastern tradition. It, um, all art, East and West, Christian art, um, from about 400, 450 AD, when the style was established, through to about 1200, was iconographic. So the Romanesque is a variant on iconographic. The Celtic is a variant on the iconographic. It, they conform to the basic principles. Um, then in the West, you get the development of the Gothic, um, and uh, then also the Baroque. The Gothic begins in about 1200, so you have figures such as Duccio and um, Giotto, I suppose, although he, he might anticipate the Renaissance. 
and then the Baroque, he says, of the art of the 17th century. <coughs> he actually says the Baroque at its best. And it was really uh, the Enlightenment crept in very quickly after its establishment and excess appeared very quickly. Um, and then finally, geometric patterned art. So let's just look at some examples. Uh, last one of writing, and then we'll have some pictures. Okay. Um, at the point I'm going to make, we're going to see some uh, photographs of paintings, is that the stylic, stylistic elements that we recognise in a painting, um, even if we can't explain them, are deviations from absolute adherence to physical appearance, whatever that means, because, of course, information goes to the eye, to the mind, and it's very difficult to, to say what something actually, what we're seeing is it in the mind, is it in the eye. But if we put that debate aside for a moment, um, that all artists deviate from physical appearance, or most, should we say, um, in order to communicate invisible truths. And in Christian art, this is done in a controlled way to reveal things such as, for example, that man has a body and a soul. And how do you show that somebody is alive and not just a wax model? Um, the deviations from strict physical appearance are the, the way in which the artist does this. And the best way to learn about this is to, is to look at traditions, is to copy them, and then have it explained to you how this is done. Um, okay, so here's an icon. Uh, I, I'll just give one example of a feature. I, as I say, I, I don't want to go into great detail. If you want more on this aspect, then you can invite me back, and I, I could do a whole lecture on it, or I could do one lecture on each tradition, uh, as much as you like. Uh, once I start, uh, it's very difficult to stop me. Um, however, uh, here's a, a Russian icon from about the 17th century. And just one little feature is there's no cast shadow here because each of these figures, even uh, obviously Christ, but also the, the um, prophets and the apostles as well, um, are shining with the uncreated light of heaven that's what the halos are they're just a representation of that light shining out of their, their heads <coughs> um, and because they're a source of light there's no cast shadow so you, I have a cast shadow here by virtue of the light there that's an external light source if I was shining with light you'd just see light around me um, similarly you wouldn't see a glint in my eye because that's reflected light so if you look at your neighbour and you see no glints, they're either a saint or dead. <laughs> um, here's another icon. Um, and then the other thing is it's deliberately painted so that it lives in the plane of the painting. You want, it has to be, you have to look at it and see what it is, which means there must be some sense of depth in order to see that uh, St. Luke's right knee is in front of his left knee. We have to be able to read that. But as far as possible... It lives in the plane of the painting because you want to convey the sense that heaven is outside time and space. So visually, that is one way of communicating it. Okay, so here's... Um, that, by the way, is uh, an icon of mine. It's St. Luke, which I did in a class. So I was very strongly directed by Aidan as I was doing that. Um, this is Caravaggio. Um, really heralding the Baroque, and it painted in about 1600, uh, the conversion of St. Paul. And we can see here, in contrast to the icon, very much, very strongly painted, cast shadow with an external light source. Um, and the focus of the Baroque is what we, John Paul II would call historical man, fallen man. And so the style changes accordingly. It's more naturalistic. It isn't... Um, photorealism. Uh, there are changes, but they're much more subtle in the Baroque, the, the abstractions that are done. Um, and interestingly, if you see this, ch this painting in Rome, um, it's in a side chapel on the left, and if you're in a position to, if you step back so you can see the painting in the side chapel and the altar in front of you, at the moment that the host is elevated, of course it looks as though that's the source of light in the painting. And so it's, it's deliberately positioned in that way. So the context and the, the place that it's painted is done so that it has an impact as a distance 
and makes the point. Okay. It's complementary to the, icon the iconographic. So why do we paint historical man? Well, we are historical man. We are fallen. Um, we have the presence of evil and suffering. We all know that. But, of course, um, there is hope, a hope that transcends that, which is hope in Christ. And so that is why you have the deep shadow, the cast shadow, but the light overcomes the darkness. And Caravaggio, um, they, they had shadow before this in the High Renaissance, but um, he really developed a, 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 a vocabulary of light and dark that and, and imbued it with spiritual meaning. Uh, Georges de la Tour, a French artist who I just love, uh, the penitent Magdalene, I think. Uh, very similar things I could say. Notice how the colour and the sharpness is focused ar around the main focus. If you go into these lower areas around here, um, it's depleted of colour, it's almost monochrome. Um, and that's so that we look at this area naturally. It also matches the way that we look at things in nature, uh, which is what they're trying to replicate. If you look at something, the image you get on the retina has a central portion which is in focus and in colour, where you have the cones, I think, so a biologist can tell me, um, and then that's the name of the cells, and then the periphery is monochrome information and it's blurred. The image we see in our mind's eye is basically, most of it is contributed by the memory, and the eye roves around. And so you've been looking at me, um, for the most part focusing on my face, occasionally my hands will move around, you'll see these. There'll be a cursory glance up and down, just so you convince yourself I'm not a floating head. Um, <laughs> but for the most part, the image of me that you see, most of what is there in your mind is supplied by the memory. Um, if you weren't able to see the rest of me, what the mind does, it draws on the, the memory of similar things um, and, if, and says, well, I don't know what this is, but I've seen something that looked a bit like this. It's probably this. Okay? And illusionists make use of that. That's how they trick you. They, they make use of the fact that what you see is not what the eye sees. Now, why are they doing this? Because they want to... Um, man is made to perceive the world in a particular way. He's made by God to respond to the beauty of the cosmos. Um, the cosmos is made for us, and we are made to see it in a particular way. And through its beauty, it inspires awe and draws us up to the Creator. So they wanted their paintings to stimulate and to c cause a similar response in us. It's that aspect, it's that understanding that's missing in 19th century art and photorealism. Uh, this changing of the focus and the colour and the sharpness of it. Here's another one by someone called Procaccini, which is in the uh, MFA, the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Again, the focus here is on the, the person of Christ, um, and the face is in shadow. It's not a portrait. It's, it's, it, it, he wants us to focus on those aspects which are general to all mankind, uh, and not so much on those that are particular to him, so that we can identify, to use the modern uh, psychological word. Um, but again, he wants us to be aware of that head, so he puts that red sleeve up there next to the, next to the face, even though it's in shadow. And then the Gothic, <coughs> you might characterise this as the art of pilgrimage, just like the Gothic spire it has one foot planted on earth and it reaches up to the heavens. And historically, of course, it's transitionary. It sits between <coughs> The, the iconographic and the Baroque. And it's, it's a, a slightly more naturalised iconographic style, and certainly when you see it in Duccio, uh, in this one here. Um, but there are changes. People who know iconography would immediately look at that and say, for example, the central figure, I think St. John, central below, is in profile. No icon would do that. So that's a, a mark of naturalisation. But it's, it's deliberately done. There, there's what they're showing us is that process of partial transformation in this life that leads ultimately to heaven. So you could say that the, the Baroque is, gives us the starting point, the Gothic gives us that transition, and then the iconographic gives us our final destination. <coughs> and they are complementary, and the, the, the stylistic elements are governed by 
uh, an integration of theology and form, which you can describe at length. Fra Angelico, um, again, he's 15th century, drawing on uh, iconographic elements, but very definitely making use of things like perspective and shadow, but selectively. He, he's, it's not like um, very different from what came in the High Renaissance. Um, in fact, he seemed to develop his own schema and combination. You could talk about Fra Angelico at length um, and just to show how he manipulated. He seemed to be aware of where this was going in the future and what happened in the past and produces a consistent uh, use of shadow and the lack of it, of uncreative light, very, very skillfully. <coughs> and then the, the final tradition is what I call geometric patterned art, um, which um, is based upon the symbolism of number. Um, so, for example, what, this is something called the quincunx, uh, which is a pattern which goes right the way back to Roman times, where you have a central five circles, central one and four spinning out. And so sometimes it represents the creation. So you have God in the center and the, the four corners of the world, if you like, spinning out from it. Um, or you could think of it as a geometric representation of Christ in majesty, where you have Christ sitting enthroned in heaven and the four evangelists um, representing the four gospels, carrying the word out to the four corners of the world, um, but symbolized in shape, in the abstract. And you can see these, for example, on sanctuary floors. It's a whole tradition that's virtually non-existent nowadays. Um, and quite easy to copy. I, we do this in at Thomas More College. We do these geometric constructions. We have to go to Islamic te textbooks because in Islamic art they're still doing this sort of stuff in order to learn how to draw it. But then, of course, we, we don't need to adopt their symbolism. We use ours. Um, you, there's a reason why this baptistry is eight-sided, which I'll come to later on. Uh, in Florence, and fonts are eight-sided. Um, and even the design of, the, of uh, Notre Dame in Paris, uh, the, there's a reason why you see predominantly these bands that divide it up into three. Um, all of these proportions are very carefully worked out according to the laws of harmony um, as observed in the cosmos, and then also, as we'll discover later, represented in the rhythms and patterns of the liturgy of our worship, uh, which you can describe numerically, and then incorporate into the design of anything, a church, a spoon, a chair, a building. Everything can be permeated with these liturgical principles and the, the beauty that directs us to God subliminally, if you like, in many cases, um, if we want it to. Of course, we have free will and we can reject it as well if we wish to, and since about 1900, that's what's been happening. Okay, so uh, just to recap, we're talking about the style here, particularly in the figurative art. Um, I didn't go talk about the content at all. Many talks about sacred art focus on the symbolism, the lily means this, and the, you know, the stars on Our Lady mean something else. That's very good as well, if it naturally communicates to people but the point that is less known is the actual style, the way in which an artist paints, uh, contains a truth as well, which we pick up naturally. Um, this is an important point. If, if it's rooted in truth, just like my experience at the Brompton Oratory, I did not know what I was seeing, that I understood at some level what was happening, what was going on there. I probably would have struggled to articulate it, but something very important communicated it itself to me because I am made to see these things by God and that work of man in the church participated in the beauty of the cosmos um, in so many different ways that, and of course the cosmos is made by the creator so it inspires us to see it, the, it, it has the, bears the thumbprint of the creator and draws us to God um, everything can be in harmony if we choose to, to make it so just a question that's often asked, why not the High Renaissance? Often a surprise. When we talk of Christian, everyone almost assumes Michelangelo, Leonardo. Well, Pope Benedict says, and I just quote this just to, uh, in case you don't believe me. Um, 
the Renaissance did something quite new. This is in the spirit of the liturgy again. Art speaks of the grandeur of man almost as if it were surprised by it. It needs no other beauty to seek. Uh, the tragic burden of antiquity is forgotten. Um, only its di divine beauty is seen. And nostalgia for the gods emerges from myth for a world without fear of sin. True, Christian subjects are still being depicted, but religious art is no longer sacred in the proper sense. It does not enter into the humility of other sacraments and their time-transcending dynamism. Um, we can think of the High Renaissance as being transitional. Um, it, a lot of what was developed by those, some of those great artists, that's not to say there weren't great individual artists during this period, um, but the Baroque of the 17th century, which is a response to the, uh, really came out of the Catholic Counter-Reformation. It was a response to the, the Reformation, a deliberate attempt to produce art forms along with everything else that would, would win back the Protestants, effectively, um, looked at this and drew it together and integrated theology and form again. The other point that needs making is that after the Enlightenment, the wider culture, this is again in, in this book, became separated from the faith stylistically in, by the 19th century and even more so in the 20th century. So uh, many people love Bouguereau, for example, the French artist, um, he does not correspond to these traditions that uh, Pope Benedict is talking about. There's a sentimentalism there. There's, there's aspects of his style which differ from that. Um, now, that's not to, you could always have great individual artists who might be worthy of the liturgy at any time. And the Pope is talking here generally. So that's if, you know, it may be that um, a particular artist is worthy of it. But um, I have to say, in my opinion, he isn't. Um, I mention him particularly because um, he's beloved of many, many uh, traditionally minded Catholics, actually. Uh, I'm going to run through this. Oh, just making the point here uh, that this process of abstraction is not just one of revealing greater truth. It, you can tell lies through it as well. Um, these comics on the right, they're well drawn, they're skillfully drawn. I asked my students what age group buys this, and they normally say about 12, something like this. Um, that is highly eroticized, and it's exaggerated, deliberately designed to draw people in by generating a disordered reaction. And the artists know what they're doing as much as the Christian artists know what they're doing or ought to. Um, so we should be aware of that. And we should be very conscious, therefore, of drawing in modern styles and just Christianizing them. Because it even if the subject matter, as we saw with the High Renaissance, the subject matter might be Christian, but the style might work against it, and sometimes even more powerfully. Um, here's Rothko. Uh, who's aware of Rothko here? Good, I see a few hands. I, I assume he's a household name. And the, the students at Thomas More, many of them have never heard of him. I don't know, he's just... Probably that's a good thing, I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> it surprises me. I, I, I always use him as an example... Um, but anyway, abstract expressions, they set out to reveal man to, to paint the soul. Now, you can't paint a soul. It's not material. Um, the soul is expressed through the body. If you want to paint man, you, sh you show the, the, the body. In other words, put simply, you know it's a man because it looks like a man. Okay? Um, and you reveal the soul in, through the body in art, just as the soul is revealed through the body in nature. Um, and so abstract expressionism is flawed, and I, I, I think this is why it, uh, it failed. Um, that's not to say that you can't have pleasing shapes and nice combinations of colours, but you can have that in carpets and interior design. You don't look at the rug and say, what's this telling me about the nature of mankind? You usually say, does this go with the sofa? Um, and that's probably the question I would ask about Rothko. <laughs> okay. Back to prayer. So that's my skip through the history of art in 15 minutes, whatever it is. Um, it's important to learn to pray well. And uh, I, don't, I don't think I'm an expert in prayer, but I, I know enough to be conscious of what was lacking when I started to think about this. Um, we're asked to engage, pray with the heart. We need to engage the whole person. So we think about the posture. 
we chant, and particularly make liturgical prayer the centre. So this is the Mass and the Liturgy of the Hours. The great thing about the Liturgy of the Hours is you can do it at home. Um, and I have to say, our Eastern brethren tend to be ahead of us uh, than the Western church on this. Uh, I've been to the families of Eastern Christians where the children are fighting each other because they, w they want it to be their turn to sing the psalms with Dad. Okay? And it's very easily accessible tones, um, unlike much of what uh, I'm asked to sing in Catholic churches. Um, so actually, when, when I started to do this, it was the East that I looked, uh, as well as the Anglican tradition, I have to say. Um, but um, just a point for artists, as that's our particular focus. Um, I don't see how an artist can possibly paint something that, or as we say, it's very unlikely that an artist can paint something that is appropriate for the liturgy and for prayer if he doesn't actually pray with visual imagery himself. When you go into a church, look at people, if, if they pray the rosary, for example, or in a family, what's the first thing that happens? Eyes closed. Um, if I go into, again, I, I notice this because of my connection with Icon, I go into Eastern liturgies, and every time a saint is mentioned, everybody turns and addresses the saint through the image. Um, it's not difficult. I, I would ask about it. I saw a, a book praying with icons about this thick, and you explain all these things. It's like a sort of visual Lexio Divina and contemplative. Now, you can do that if you wish, but from what I can tell, um, you pray with images just like you pray without them. You, you say or sing your prayers, but you let the image engage your sight. And if it's well painted, it will direct your prayer. It will add to it uh, despite yourself. It's really the job of the artist to direct us. It's not a skill particularly that's learned by the prayer. The prayer, uh, the, the Holy Spirit will help us to pray. Um, but so much of it, let's put it like that, of course it can work both ways, is done by the artist. So if I just show you Duccio here, um, in common with icons, this is something that's painted in the middle distance, the edges are all sharp, everything's very clear. Because the images are in the middle distance, which is, again, governed by the artist and the angle of vision, that you, you can <coughs> paint things in different ways so that they're either in the foreground the middle ground or the background. So there's effectively no foreground in this. It's middle distance to where it is. And so it draws you in. If you see a, a painting um, in a, uh, somewhere with a candle in front of it, you want to go in and see it. And as you get closer, it reveals more detail. And this is consistent with the, the heavenly realm, where to see something is to know it fully. And so you get, you're, you're given lots and lots of detail. Um, and of course you can get so close you can get to the point where your nose is actually against the, the icon but still they're in the middle distance it's like having your nose pressed against the, the shop window and you can't get any closer but you can see them beyond so what does it do? it then draws your spirit up to the, the, the saint or Christ in heaven so it really does transport us spiritually up to heaven our attention upwards um, and that it's calling us to heaven from above, the, the icon, and the Gothic art that is, should we say, at the top of the steeple that derives heavily from it. Contrast it with this, this um, Baroque piece by Velazquez. This is a very famous crucifixion. Um, you see it in the Prado, you look at it and you just think, that is perfect. Okay? Uh, it's big, I don't know... Uh, 12, 15 feet. It's a, it's a big painting. As you approach it, it looks like that. It's very rough, okay? It, it dissolves, and as you get closer, it dissolves into a mass of brush strokes. You can't believe it. You, you think this looked perfect when I was standing back here. As I get closer, it, it seems to disintegrate. The loincloth is so roughly drawn. Now, actually, they used to do this by constantly walking backwards and forwards so that effectively they painted from memory from a long way back they would walk forward, paint from memory and then come back and, and check it um, 
although the, the story is that not Velazquez, he actually just had 10 foot brushes and would just, <laughs> just paint. Uh, but when I learned in Florence, we had to walk backwards and forwards. So it means it's in focus at a distance. I don't know if you ever had that experience in art galleries when you approach a painting and it's pushing you back. So the dynamic is very different here. This is saying, you stay where you are, I'm coming to you. And remember what, what this art is doing. It's giving us hope in this life. It's, it's making Christ's presence here with us to, to carry us up. The icon calls us up to heaven. The Baroque lifts us up. Um, it's like Jacob's ladder with the angels coming up and the angels going down. They're complementary. And this, is, this happens naturally through the skill of the artist. If we pray to it, it will just happen. And that's the, the imagery is giving us the message that the artist intends and supporting our prayer. Right, final phase. I talked about geometric and patterned art and um, also the, 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 the importance of the symbolism of number. I, I skirted over it. I just really didn't talk about it in great detail. Now, I'm just going to go pray some, give you some examples of how that how you can see that and how it really is united to the liturgy. But before I do it, I just want to say that if we pray the liturgy, we're praying the, the, the pattern of the cosmos, um, which ultimately points to the, the, the pattern of heaven. And Pope Benedict calls it, the, it's a glimpse into the mind of the creator, the rhythms and the patterns. Of course, they follow the, the phases of the moon, um, the daily pattern as well. And a proper prayer life, again, I'm not an expert, but it's, it, the sense I get from talking to people who know more about this than me is centred on the liturgy and then supported by prayers and devotions. Lexia Divina, contemplative prayer, seems to be emphasised, especially scripture, almsgiving and fasting and feasting. In some balance, as directed by a spiritual director, each person is different. But... I'm going to, the Liturgy of the Hours is really important, because, and I, I point this out because it's so often neglected. Um, and the church tells us that it's the way of taking the Mass out into the day, in a way. It's, it's, it's the prayer that sanctifies the day. In other words, it, it gives, it's a means of, giving us, of opening the channels, if you like, to God's grace in our ordinary activities. Um, and, and by these, this repetitive prayer, it's the, it's the way that we can achieve the ideal of praying continuously. In the, the Psalms, there's a, a quotation that says the word of God is pure. I, I, can't, I never get things right perfectly, but it says, as pure as silver, seven times refined. That means perfect. If it's something's repeated seven times, it's, it is perfect. It's as though it's done continuously. And in the liturgy of the hours, we pray seven times a day. And the, the psalmist also says, seven times a day, I will praise you, O Lord. And once during the watches of the night, so there's an eighth. We'll come to that in a second. Okay. So if we pray, especially the liturgy of the hours in conjunction with the Mass, of course, and I'm not mentioning that because I, I, I'm assuming that with my audience here, that's a given. We become aware of these rhythms and patterns so much, uh, which ultimately is the pattern of the beauty of the cosmos. Um, so much more, it imprints itself upon our souls, if I can put that, because we're opening ourselves up uh, to God in a very special way in liturgical worship. So let's just look at this. Here we have geometric patterns based upon the number eight. Now, I don't know how many, I'm imagining a few of you will be aware that the, the number eight is important because it, it represents the eighth day. So that there are seven days of creation, and that's the weekly cycle that uh, people live by. And then the church fathers, and particularly Augustine, that, that I read, would talk about Christ representing the eighth day, the, the culmination of this. Um, now, how is this organized in time? Um, well, we go from Sunday through to Sunday, and Sunday is simultaneously the eighth day of the previous week and the first of the next. And so we can think of it as, we, instead of doing this self-enclosed cycle of seven, we actually go Saturday, the little room Saturday, and then on Sunday, of course, we move forward to begin the next week, but we do a vector shift up into a different, a new dimension because of the eighth day, the, the 
remember the eighth day represents the eighth age, if you like, the incarnation, uh, the life, death and resurrection of Christ. And if you think of these as vectors, what is then happening, instead of being a self-enclosed circle, it becomes a spiral. It's a helix. And it's spiraling. We just have to sit there for the ride that helix takes us up to heaven. Um, we follow the patterns of the liturgy. Um, that's on the weekly basis. On a daily basis, the liturgy of the hours marks seven hours during the day and one at night. So there's that pattern of seven plus one again. Um, according to the rule of St. Benedict, for example, you, you see that. Um, and so you have this daily helix of prayer sitting on the weekly helix of prayer. And then in the course of the year, of course, the great event that moves one year into the next is Easter. It's the Sunday of Sundays. And when we get to each Easter, we don't think, you know, surely we've got Easter right by now. Do we have to do it again? E each one is fresh and new. It, we're, we're moving forward. Uh, we're repeating it, but it's new as well. It's because we're moving forward in sacred time on a grand arc, um, of the helix of the year. And you can see these patterns of seven and eight. Uh, just also elsewhere in the liturgy, you have octaves. The, the eight days of eight days after Easter, after Christmas. Um, and I think of it rather like having a ball sitting on a fountain where it's, it's at an elevated state uh, during Easter. But it's not as if it's, it's inactive. It may seem stationary, but there's a flood tide of grace holding it up during that week. That, and we're, we're just sitting there supported through the liturgy, through this. Um, so that pattern is there, and we become so much more aware of it if we're at least participating in some of that pattern of the Liturgy of the Hours as well. And it's represented geometrically in these, in these church floors that you see in medieval churches. And in the, the baptistry and the fonts. Um. Right, now, here's Raphael. Um, what's this got to do with the eighth day? Well, this, this sits... This painting is in the, it's called the Mons Crucifixion, it's in the National Gallery in London, and if you just look at, I was looking at it one day, look, actually looking at a lecture on it, I've seen it many times in London, I'm just thinking, these feet look kind of strange, they're this rather contorted, and it's not like Raphael, because everything tends to be just very serene. Um, and then I noticed that in fact, um, he put them in that position, so that if you trace the line of the heads to the feet and these heads here. What's the shape that's produced? It's an octagon. Now, that's not accidental. He, we know that he's aware of this because in his fresco, the School of Athens, he did a fresco of Pythagoras with a diagram of these symbolic numbers and the musical harmony. So we know that he knew about this. Um, and he would put this in there because... He would consider it due proportion. It's part of the design that is appropriate to what it is. And it's not a secret signal for those who are in the know. He would do this because he believed that we would naturally pick this up, whether we spot the octagon or not. It, it allows the painting to communicate through its beauty more readily to us the truth that is contained within it. And so if we give ourselves to the liturgy and to these patterns... We can, impressed upon our souls can be the, the pattern of heaven that not only guides us and inspires us, but it, it, it develops our intuitive sense of what is right and good and beautiful. And because beauty is linked to love, we, we perceive, it, perceive it intuitively and it draws us out of ourselves to love what we see and then true beauty beyond to the creator, to the source of all beauty. It actually um, makes us better lovers, more able to love our fellow man, and more inclined to do so. Okay, this is a house in Shropshire in England, built not by Catholics, by Protestants as far as I'm aware, and it's called Attingham House, um, probably in the 18th century, or maybe 17th century. Very, very simple design, uh, palladium-influenced. 
But the main house is effectively a square box with this sort of Roman-looking arch and the overextended columns on the front. Um, hundreds of thousands of people visit this every year. Why do they come? Well, it's because of the beauty of the place. What gives it the beauty? Well, let's just have a look. Um, the architect wasn't thinking of liturgy and rhythms and patterns. He's a Protestant, so I'm guessing that he didn't. But he was using... Um, traditional proportion and harmony, which for the Christian um, is derived from that, um, he would feel able to do it because it's also described in Vitruvius, who was a Roman architect, and so he wouldn't worry about the Catholic connection. But the principle is the same. And you do notice that these three stories are a different size. And there's a sense of harm, a, a rhythmical development that the first relates to the second as the second to the third. And that is what proportion is. You have a minimum of three uh, levels of different size. It's a consonant relationships between different things. Modern buildings have everything the same size. Um, and so if you go, I'm just walking, looking out at Greenwich Village, is it close to St. Joseph? The buildings there were built in the 19th century, and the, the, there are three and four story buildings with different size windows in perfect proportion. And that's what gives the charm to Greenwich Village. Where they abandon it, um, you have these solar skyscrapers that people complain about in modern cities. Now, what's the basis of this particular proportion? There are many, but in this case, it's musical. Remember that we're, we're, if we think of the octave, of, we're using that word. If you mention to people what an octave is, the first thing that comes to mind is eight notes in a scale. That's what we tend to think of, first of all. And contained within that are principles of harmony. Um, so the first thing is, if you pluck a note on a stringed instrument and play the open note, and then you fret it halfway down so that the ratio of the legs is one to two, the note that you produce is an octave higher. So that numerical ratio, one to two, became associated with a, a consonant relationship of the octave. And then there are other fundamental harmonies of a perfect fourth and a perfect fifth. And they have the ratio one to two and two to three and then three to four. The octave, fifth and fourth. If you just measure the lengths of the strings. Now, they would assume, and it's just an assumption, that the basis of the beauty of music is number. It's, it's the numerical relationship that we're perceiving in the intellect. And therefore, if you incorporate that into design of buildings the building will be beautiful as well. And so the, the reason I chose this example is if we just count window panes here, you have two, four, and then six. So it's one to two to three. So it's the one to two is the octave, two to three is the fifth. So they've just built into the window sizes that musical harmony. Now for the figures such as Boethius and Augustine who brought this tradition from the classical period very strongly into the Christian world. Um, for them, all of this beauty was the, really was the numerical description, the beauty of the cosmos, which we are made to hear and be aware of, because then it draws us up to God. And so it makes sense that you want to make man's work, that all aspects of the culture not just religious things, participate in that beauty. And so, without being aware of it, the, the, the power of the beauty of, of these harm, of these proportions, um, these Protestant uh, designers, architects, are actually reflecting the, the, the church's liturgy, and that's the source of its beauty. Now, this is important because this actually primes us, it primes people like me, who'd never been into a Catholic church, so that when I walked into the Brompton Oratory, it, it, something struck a chord, that I'd seen enough of these things in South Kensington and the British Museum and over a sufficient time, that it corresponded to an aspect of my receiving of it that was already stimulated to see those things, or predisposed, I should say, to see that. And the more we can do that, the more we actually through beauty um, can uh, affect people so that they have a, they're ready to hear the word um, should they hear it. So you have to motivate people so that they want to hear it. And it's through the beauty of the culture 
that will do that. So it's a personal transformation and then making all our work reflect that liturgical model. Um, and it's this conformity to the liturgy, really, which is the source of everything. And with that, I will stop. That's the last. <laughs> <laughs>